在基督教浸泡多年的信徒都熟知《使徒信经》，却不晓得童贞女玛利亚感孕到本丢比拉多手下受难之间，缺失的正是四福音书最重要的内容——耶稣的服饰和教导。当麦克鲁德把四福音书中有关语言学、奇异的问题抛向尼西米寻求帮助，这位加莱特人才开始帮助我们查考一切能够查阅到的希伯来原文手稿。在这个过程，尼西米发现了宝贵的希伯来文马太福音手稿，从原文角度完美解答了儒德的提问。另一个意外收获是帮我们从耶稣作为犹太先知的视角，坚信他来是为了维护妥拉。而非废掉托拉。第三个意外收获是，尼西米竟然发现了至少二十八份马太福音希伯来原文手稿。当儒德在节目中给大家推荐在西方基督教颇有影响力的乔治·霍华德所著的《希伯来文马太福音》时，尼西米从两方面评价了这本书。这本基于九份希伯来语原文手稿的著作出版，已经是一个非常伟大的发现。但是，翻译中的英文括号内容是霍华德本人认为的意思，而非希伯来原文意思，因此这里有受到希腊文思维模式的影响。古代犹太人以希伯来文秘密抄写新约圣经，多少也会受到希腊文的侵蚀。We are back with Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah, Michael, you just said something profound. That as I was sitting here listening, you, you talked about how the the Christian world, how how the purpose that, as you're understanding Jesus Yeshua came, was for people to listen to him as you would listen to a prophet, a Hebrew prophet. In other words, you know, when Jeremiah came, the purpose of Jeremiah wasn't to believe in Jeremiah. The purpose was to listen and obey what he said.、Mm -hmm. And you know, years ago, I, I heard this lecture from a, a professor of New Testament studies, and he was talking about the Apostles' Creed. And he said something profound that never left me. He was talking about in the Apostles' Creed, which I guess they recite in a lot of churches. And, and I'm reading yeah, it here. From, yeah, yeah. I guess like the, the foundation of the Christian faith, according yeah, to so, uh, uh, Constantine. So, so <laughs> okay. But he, well, that's interesting that you say that. So I'm going to read this. Not that I'm reading this as my faith, but this is what Christians recite. They say, "I believe in God the Father, Creator of heaven and earth," and we got that out of the way. That's easy. And in Jesus Christ, His、uh, only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, suffered under Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he, this is the Catholic version.、Uh, third day, He rose from the dead. He descended.、Okay. And as and we can go through the whole thing, but the point is that、um, so the professor of New Testament studies, you know, recited this for us, and he said, "What's missing?" And you know, nobody knew what's, what's missing. <laughs> I want a soul. And, and he said, "So what's missing is everything between born of the Virgin Mary and suffered under Pontius Pilate." The, which is、There、the is. bulk of the four gospels. If you、right. count up the words in the four gospels, you'll find, and I don't know what the number is, but something like eighty, ninety percent of the words are not mentioned in this in this gospels creed. That's and, right. And His whole ministry, everything ministry. he taught, is <laughs> missing. It's、right. not there. So it's, it's a, like irrelevant. So what they've come to is, and look, I'm not a Christian. Far be it for me to, to to point this out. This is a professor of New Testament studies pointing out that Christians have a belief in Jesus. But they don't believe Jesus, because if you believe Jesus、Brilliant. in a Hebrew、Brilliantly、sense,、spoken. yeah, if you believe Jesus in a Hebrew sense, you listen and obey what he said. Right. And so, what did he actually say? And look, I, again, I'm not coming as a Christian. I studied ancient Hebrew texts, and that eventually led me to study a Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. I, you have a book I wrote here about it. The Hebrew,、mm -hmm. yeah. the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. And I wrote absolutely a, you know, brilliant piece of work and lay down some of the foundations、mm -hmm. in there about this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, which for me I was studying this as an ancient text and found that that you know coming at it completely objectively without a skin in the game, I saw that there were certain things that and actually that you had brought up to me that in the in the Greek New Testament in five thousand manuscripts contradicts what Yeshua taught. From one chapter to another chapter, from 15 to 23, and we found the change of one letter in the Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. Everything fits perfectly into place, and right, then things、right. you didn't even realize don't fit fit even better in the Hebrew. So it's beautiful just how that all came together. And, and I completely give you credit for bringing this to my attention because I didn't even I was able to answer the problem once I knew what the question was. I didn't even know what the question was, right? Right. You know, right.、Um, once I knew the question, I was able to look at the Hebrew sources and find the answer. 
And, um, and then I wrote another book called A Prayer to Our Father on the Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer. Well, let's, let, let's, let, let's stop yeah. and talk about this for just yeah. a moment. Uh, because, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most important books in this generation. It is absolutely profound. And uh, I, I was uh, I invited Nehemi over to the house. I, I said, uh, because I had a real dilemma. I had a real problem in the real world with people that I saw their lives being completely twisted and, and bad things happening because they believed that they were doing what Jesus, Yeshua, said to do. And in, uh, in Matthew 23, he said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatsoever they bid, which is Old English for command you to do and observe, that do and observe. Uh, and, and really, there's no way to get out of it. And in, in, in any Greek text, you go right back to the Greek, you can't get out of it. But this is contrary to what anything that we saw in Yeshua's life. And this is what I brought Nehemiah yeah. over to the house, and I said, yeah. Nehemiah, there's no way on God's green earth that Yeshua could have said this, and you yeah. said, why? And so we spent like three hours going yeah. through the Gospels to see, right. and you finally said, yeah, this, this is uh, well, apparently and, and, and contradictory. So one of the places you really see a contradiction, what really seems like a contradiction between what Yeshua says in Matthew 23 is in Matthew 15 with the washing of the hands. So in Matthew 23, he says, whatever the Pharisees command you to do, you gotta do it. And in Matthew 15, his disciples sit down to eat bread, and they don't wash their hands. And the Pharisees come in and they rebuke Jesus. They say, what's going on? Your disciples aren't following the tradition of the elders. And there's a contrast there when you read it, even in the Greek, between the tradition of the elders and the commandment of God. Mm -hmm. And I knew immediately what that meant because in my tradition growing up as, as a modern day Pharisee, as an Orthodox Jew, I was taught that washing the hands before you eat bread wasn't commanded by God. In fact, it was commanded by the rabbis and because God commanded us to obey the rabbis, according to the rabbis, <laughs> um, washing your hands was, was in some ways more important than actually obeying God himself. And there's a statement in the Talmud that says, if you violate a commandment of the rabbis, the punishment is death. Whereas if you violate one of God's commandments, the punishment is only lashes, 39 lashes. So imagine that, that, that there's a more severe atmosphere around observing rabbinical commandments, commandments that they say that they invented, what are called takanot, mm -hmm. these man-made rules and regulations. I talk about that in the book, The Hebrew Show versus the Greek Jesus. And, and as we were sitting and talking about this, you know, one of the things I, I had observed, and you had observed people like this as well, were uh, they were Jews who came to believe in Yeshua, moved to Israel, and then they read Matthew 23, and it said, all therefore whatsoever the Pharisees command you to do, and, and you had these modern day rabbis who are the con direct continuation of the ancient Pharisees, mm -hmm. right. and they said, well, so we've got to obey them. And, and the and, So they go check into yeshiva. And right, start, and uh, what they find out in the yeshiva is some of the things the Pharisees teach, the Pharisees themselves don't even do. But Yeshua talks about that. He says they lay heavy burdens upon people, so do it. Don't do what they do. Do what they, you know, do what they command, what they teach, not what they, um, what they actually do in practice. And, and it comes to the point where you're following rules and regulations, which seem, um, you know, beyond like OCD. Like literally, there's a commandment in the oral law that when you wake up in the morning, first you put on your right shoe, and then you don't, but you don't tie it. Then you put on your left shoe, tie your left shoe, and tie your right shoe. Well, most Orthodox Jews don't do that, and I don't know if ancient Pharisees did it. But people who are coming at this. You know, they're born Jewish, learned about Yeshua and believe in him, and they read what Yeshua says. They say, well, we got to do the shoe thing. Even if the rabbis don't do it, we have to obey the Pharisees even more than the Pharisees taught, actually do in practice because it's what they taught. Right, and, and then they think that if they do it even better than them, they're going to provoke them to jealousy. I, I it, guess yeah, that, that, that comes I, in there too. I guess that might be part one of the considerations, mm -hmm. but then you see them washing their hands and you're like, wait a minute, but didn't, didn't Yeshua's disciples not follow this man-made rule? And, and, and what you only know once you're deep in it, me growing up in it, I, I, I was born in it, but when you're deep in it, you realize it's not just washing your hands with soap to get the dirt off. That's not what washing the hands is. Right. Washing the hands is you take, do, go through a special hand-washing ritual and you make the blessing. Blessed out thou, Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, commanding us to wash the hands. And there's no question in the rabbinical tradition that when you say this blessing, 
that you're acknowledging that God didn't command you to wash the hands. He commanded me to obey the rabbis who commanded me to wash the hands. So it's a daily proclamation of the God-given authority of the rabbis. And it was that very ritual that the disciples of Yeshua said, well, we're not doing that. We, we've right. got our rabbi here, and he's not telling us to do it, meaning Yeshua. Right, yeah, and, and it's only, you know, you can eat meat and not wash the hands, mm -hmm. but you cannot eat bread. Right, specifically bread. Specifically and, bread, um, and so what does he do? He feeds right. 5,000 people yeah. with, un, with 11 barley loaves up in the Galilee, and then another 4,000, and are they all taking the two-handled pot and Probably washing Probably not. No, absolutely yeah. not, because so. that's where another situation where the Pharisees come from Jerusalem, why do your disciples break the talk and note of the elders? Because right. they don't wash their hands. Right. He just got through feeding 5,000, plus women and children, and nobody did it. So you end up with this, um, this irreconcilable contradiction once you actually take what Yeshua taught seriously, right? Once you get past, you know, born of a virgin, suffering under Pilate, and you actually look what's in the middle there, mm -hmm. which is the 30 approximate years of Yeshua's life and the, and the year, the, the, you know, the, the teachings of his ministry, the bulk of the Gospels, then you're stuck with, well, wait a minute, what he said in Matthew 23 in the Greek doesn't fit everything else he taught which is obey the commandment of God, not the tradition of the elders. And then all of a sudden um, he says, what, well, all whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. I mean, so it doesn't make sense in the Greek. And that was, you know, you brought up the, the problem. I, I said there know, every yeah. extent Greek text on the planet says the yeah. same thing. It, yeah. it's, there, there's something wrong here. Right. And so I went and looked at the sources and, you know, this is what I do. This is what I did. This was my profession. You know, you have a textual problem. Tip. <laughs> and wait, now, yeah. first of all, you come from a tradition that yeah. if you read the Gospels, you yeah. have no part in the world to come. Right. Well, I, now so, you're, so, uh, so I mean, in the Hebrew University context, this is what I was trained for years to do. If you have a textual problem, the first thing you do is you look at the manuscripts. You, you know, you look at the key manuscripts and you see other other manuscripts, you know, and, and of course we're usually dealing with the Old Testament. So you look at the key Old Testament manuscripts, you look at the, you know, the Targum and the Pshita and the, and the Septuagint. What does all the textual evidence say? And so in the context of doing that, I stumble upon this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, which solves everything. I wasn't looking for it. I was, I looked at the Greek. <laughs> I looked at the, the, um, the, the Pshita, which is the Aramaic. Mm -hmm. I looked at the Old Latin. I looked at everything I could find. Then I thought, well, I'm, I'm done. I'm out of, well, let me do a little search. Here. Oh, there's a Hebrew Matthew. Let me see what that's about. First, I had to read the book, see, is this legitimate? I, I was convinced by it. Find that there's a single difference of one letter that completely changes the meaning. And everything fell into place. Like, you know, and, and the funny thing is, I didn't want to write this book. If you remember, I came to you at <laughs> right. your apartment in Jerusalem. I said, Matthew, I said, Matthew, I said, uh, Michael, this is important. You need to share this with your people. And we, I don't know how long we spent, and I was explaining it to you, and you, and you said to me, Nehemi, I can't go tell people I found something in, in Hebrew manuscripts. Yeah. And I'm like, well, right. I can't do it. I can't teach about Yeshua. I'm Jewish. I'll be tarred and feathered. I'll lose friends. I'll lose family. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, I felt, you know, under the conviction that I had to do it, that this was too important for me not to share this with people. And, and that's the book that came out of it. And, and, and you, you saw a lot, you know, as you delved into it, you saw yeah. a lot of what Yeshua was teaching yeah. that really uh, agreed with where you were coming from mm -hmm. and, and started to make the transition uh, mm -hmm. from you know questioning the rabbis and realizing, yeah. no, the word says this, God's yeah. word says this, the rabbis say that, and you're seeing that Yeshua is mm -hmm. teaching the same thing. Yeah, that, that kind of are, so that kind of surprised me that you'd have someone 2,000 years ago, someone I'd heard about my whole life, Jesus Christ, what I heard about Jesus Christ is my people were persecuted in his name. They were uh, forced to convert to Catholicism in his name. They were tortured to death on the rack in his name. That's what Jesus represented to me, suffering and persecution and the ab abolition of everything I hold sacred, that he came to do away with the age-old covenant between the God of Israel and his people, he abolished all that and made a new covenant with the Gentiles. That was the Jesus I knew about from the culture in America that, I, that was surrounding me. And here I'm reading in this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, and, and in the Greek, you find it as well. He says, I've come not to do away with one jot or one tittle in Matthew 5, 17. And I'm there dealing with the jots and tittles, and I'm like, oh, wow. So he, he wait a minute, that that's not the Jesus of Christianity. And look, I'm not telling Christians what they should believe. If they want to proclaim the, the Apostles' Creed, that, that's a, a matter of faith. 
you know, for, for, you know, between them. Right. That, that's their religion. Right. That's their religion. Well, Whatever. And, I mean, religion. And it, and it could be a matter of faith. But if you say that you believe in this man, shouldn't you know what he said? Shouldn't you focus? And, that, mm-hmm. and that's where I can provide some perspective. Okay. Everything in between born of a virgin and suffering under Pilate. So let's, that's where I can bring some perspective. Here was a Jewish prophet who was preaching to a Jewish audience, speaking to them in their terms. They knew what jots and tittles were. They went to the synagogue every Shabbat and they encountered these things. They knew the, the precision of the nuance between Barkat and Bereket. This was something they heard every week in the synagogue. And so when he says that, they're like, oh, okay, this guy isn't coming to do away with the covenant of Sinai. You know, heaven forbid, he's coming. He's talking about fulfillment and bringing it to a, a back to its original understanding and wait a minute, our rabbi in the synagogue is sitting in that chair called the seat of Moses telling us what it means. And it's completely different than what's being read from the scroll, hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. you have the, them sitting in the seat of Moses. I mean, that's, that's the name. Right. You know, Scribes and Pharisees, sit in Moses' seat. Whatever right. they command you to do and right. observe, that do and observe. And that was actually a chair in the synagogue. And, and, and when I you know, read that in, in the Gospels and knew about it from archaeology, so when you read the scroll to this day, you stand out of respect for the scroll. But back then, when the rabbi would explain what was in the scroll, meaning interpret the scroll, um, in other words, say whatever he wanted to say that the scroll said, he'd be sitting in this chair of authority. So mm-hmm. there was a distinction between what the reader read from standing in the scroll, holding the scroll, between that and what the man in the seat of Moses was proclaiming it to mean. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I said that you know what I focus on is between born of a virgin and suffered under Pilate. But I want to I want to go outside the bounds of that just for a minute if you'll bear with me if if you'll if you'll if you'll give me some grace here. Oh, okay. There's this All amazing right. passage in the Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, which is earth shattering. It's unbelievable. So the first two words Jesus speaks after the resurrection. Now Matthew twenty eight nine. And look, I'm not I'm not talking here from a perspective of faith. I'm a Jew. I'm not a Christian. But this is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew in both the Greek and the Hebrew. And what's recorded in the Greek is the first word, it's actually one word in the Greek, chairita, which in the English is translated as all hail. That's a perfectly good Greek greeting. All, all hail. hail, Caesar, right? It's, it sounds Greek, it sounds Roman. In the Hebrew, the first two words he speaks are Yehovah Yoshia, Yehovah will save you. Yehovah is wow. the name of the Father, and the name of the Father in the ancient Hebrew Yehovah, some people say Yahweh. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that in a future session about how it's actually Yehovah. But his first two words that he speaks in the Hebrew version of Matthew, according to you know the one preserved by Jewish scribes, remember how meticulous Jewish scribes are. The first two words are Yehovah Yoshia. Yehovah Yoshia. Which means Yehovah will save you. Okay, now let's go back to what the angel told both oh. Miriam and Yosef to name the child. So the angel says... In it, from the Hebrew Matthew. Right, so in the Hebrew Matthew, it says to call the child Yeshua. And why Yeshua? Because Yoshia et ami, he will save my people. Same word, Yoshia. Yeshua, right. Yoshia, and his first words at the resurrection is Yehovah. Yoshia. Which is also the meaning of his name. The right. name Yeshua means Yehovah Yoshia. Yehovah will save. So the first two words literally that he speaks, according to the Hebrew version of Matthew, preserved by Jewish scribes, is Yehovah Yoshia, which is the meaning of the name Yeshua and means Yehovah will save. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, there are so <laughs> many treasures in this because you are going to be given a treasure. You're going to see, as Nehemiah takes you through here, the, 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 the smallest marking in the Hebrew manuscript changes the whole meaning because it doesn't say whatsoever they, the scribes and Pharisees say, you obey and do. No, that's not what it says in the, in, the, in the Hebrew Matthew. And it is because Nehemiah found this, and we are going to in, uh, also add with this the Hebrew Matthew. This is the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and uh, Nehemiah, I want you to talk a little bit about this because um, I, I think that, you know, for, for me, the, one of the most important things is the, the apparatus, the, the critical oh, apparatus yeah. in this. If you don't read that, then, you know, don't even buy it, you know, because you have well, to understand I, I, what this is because there's no such thing as a monolith, the Hebrew Matthew, and here it is. Right, so we have, so, so all right, so how, Hebrew Matthew was discovered by this professor named George Howard in the 1980s. As far as I know, he passed away. Um, 
And, and it's really interesting. So I actually recently met the publisher of this book. Oh. And I met him at, at, a, at a conference and I said, oh, you, you're, you're uh, you know, the guy who publishes this book. And I told him who I was and he says, you have no idea how much trouble you've caused us. They publish dozens and dozens of books and they have one book that people call up and yell at them. And they call up and they yell and they talk to the poor people on the phone who, who don't know anything about this. They're like, you know, working in the fulfillment department. And they say, why does it say in there what it says in the English? It's not what it says in the Hebrew. And they're like, whoa, we don't, we, we just fulfill orders. We, we, don't know, like, we don't know what you're talking about. And, and so I want to give credit and honor to George Howard. What he did was brilliant, groundbreaking work. Mm -hmm. But he was working, first of all, with nine manuscripts. And he was starting nine, out... Nine Hebrew manuscripts. Nine Hebrew manuscripts. Today we know of 28 manuscripts. Wait, uh, ladies and gentlemen, why there are 28 is because Nehemiah has traveled the world. He's gotten into archives. He has found these things over, what is it, the last 14 years? No, well, even I mean, most than of those I discovered probably by around 2005. There were a couple more I discovered after that. But you have no idea what painstaking work it was, Michael. Um, I looked through hundreds of manuscripts searching for this exact text. And most of them had nothing to do with Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Most of them were you know, completely unrelated texts. But the only way to know that was to check them and study them. And just to give you an idea, I was looking through archives where in the catalog it would say something like, uh, you know, uh, Jewish polemical work which means it's some kind of dialogue between Jews and Christians. It could be this, it could be something else. Most of the mm -hmm. time it was something else. But I had no idea, you know, or it would say collection of Jewish works. Well, that could be anything, right? right. I looked yeah. through hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts in order to identify 28. There could be more, actually. I would be shocked if there are not more than 28. Um, right. But, but right now I currently find, know of 28. You know, now 28. Right. Uh, and so, well. for example, um, so he knew about nine of them. And then the part of the problem is when he went to translate the texts he had, he was really coming from the perspective of a New Testament professor deep mm -hmm. in the Greek text. And you'll see he'll put words in parentheses. And nowhere in the book does he explain what those parentheses are. But the per, what the parentheses represent is, I decided not to translate what's in the Hebrew text. I decided to translate what it says in the Greek. Well, well then why did you bother? <laughs> And if you look at this, yeah, I don't know yeah. if you, they can open up and see it. So he's got the Hebrew on one side, and he has the Greek on, or sorry, the English on the other. And you'll and I read the Hebrew. You know, I can read the Hebrew without any problem. Az halach echad shmo yuda eskariato. It's about Jews Iscariot. I mean, so you can if you can read the Hebrew, it's no problem. If you look at the English, and you all of a sudden see these words in bracket in, in parentheses, and you're like, okay, well, why is that different? And, and so the problem is the, ink, the words in parentheses are what the Greek says. And, and, and really, if we're honest, the words in parentheses are what Howard wanted the text to say, not what it said. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah. and I'm actually currently working on the 28 manuscripts, and it's a problem. Because sometimes you come to a passage and you read what it says in the manuscript and you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I should just translate what the Greek says because it makes so much more sense. And then, you know, sometimes I'll discuss it with, with especially somebody coming from a New Testament perspective with a Christian, a Messianic, and he'll say, well, don't you see, Nehemiah, what this means? No, tell me. <laughs> oh, wow. And you see what the Hebrew says is amazing, and you completely missed it because you're, you're, you're so, like, coming from, here's what we expect the text to say, mm -hmm. and it doesn't say right. that, so you kind of you want to gloss over, it's really difficult. And so I'm working on this project currently, I'm working on it for years, and I have this person who, who, who's, you know, I bounce ideas off and he says, oh, Nehemia, you're being George Howard. And I'm like, what do you mean? He says, you're translating what you want it to say, not what it says. And I'm like, oh, you're right. Ah. And it's really hard. Oh yeah. It's yeah. not easy. I, I give him a lot of credit, but there's amazing things in there when you look at the Hebrew text. And I think everybody should own this book. Support the ministry, support what we're doing, help to get this out, okay? Step in and do something that, that's gonna be great for you. Now, Nehemia, uh, we, we just got a, uh, just a, a, a minute, if you, if you can give us a, a little bit of background, why we have these different manuscripts, why do they read differently, and why isn't there just one monolith, this is the Hebrew Matthew? Well, so you had Jewish rabbis who were copying this book in secret. I mean, it, it, was, it was, you know, when the, you have to understand, it was illegal for a Jew to own a copy of the New Testament. Jews were accused of doing the worst things. They were accused of breaking into the Catholic churches 
and kidnapping the wafer, the Eucharist, and sticking pins in it to torture the body of Christ. And so if a Jew was found to own a copy of the New Testament, the entire Jewish community could be persecuted. So when you're doing these things in secret, it creates all kinds of limitations where you can't openly send it to another rabbi and say, hey, check out and make sure I copied this right. You can't do that. Like what they did with the Old Testament is they'd travel across the world to check their Bibles. They were really limited and they had to do it really in secret. And then sometimes they'd say, uh-oh, that's different than what I was told the Greek text says. And if the Christians find out that my Hebrew text is different than the Greek, we might be killed for this if they find out. So we better correct it to the Greek. So you have these processes going there on. There it is, corrected for, according right. to the Greek. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things George Howard, one of the brilliant discoverers, is he finds over time as the manuscripts develop, they become more and more like the Greek. So the earliest ones and the, the most authentic ones are, are, you read them and you're like, there's no way this was translated from Greek. Mm -hmm. the, you know, this is not what a Greek translation sounds like for, in Hebrew. And then you read uh, some of the other ones and you're like, okay, they fixed this and made it more Greek. And I understand now that I'm working on it, mm -hmm. how tempting that is. Because you're like, well, that's not what it's supposed to say. Well, who says? Yeah. The Greek says that. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, unbel it's such an exciting process of what's going on there. He began the process, this man, George Howard, and, and, and we're, we're living in such exciting times where, where the process is continuing. Well, we're gonna pick up with this, uh, with this process and find out what revelations are coming about so we can understand the message of the prophet, what he actually taught, and uh, we are going to, now I'll have you close with the Aaronic blessing. Yivarechecha Yehovah v'yishmerecha, Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'chunecha, Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha, Yehovah lift his face towards you. V'yasem lecha shalom, and may he give you peace. Amen. Amen.